All right, so next up we have uh, Ryan Carniato. Uh, he actually spoke at React Finland last year, I believe. Um, and uh, he is the creator of SolidJS, which, uh, which Mishko mentioned multiple times. He also works at Netlify, where I believe they sponsor him to do uh, open source on Solid. Um, very excited to hear what Ryan has been working on uh, since the last year's session, which was wonderful. And as soon as we have a presenter view done, suspense. Why the suspense? I like how he's creating a theme for us. All right. There we go. Look at it in record time. Everyone give it up for Ryan Carniato. Thank you. Thank you. Do we got audio? All right. Uh, yeah, a little quicker than last year. Uh, setting up two laptops is always a little bit of fun, but I love live coding. It's like my favorite thing. Again, I'm, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. I'm pretty excited today to talk about a slightly different topic. We will talk about signals a little bit, I, I promise. But um, I spent the last couple of years going around telling everyone about signals. Um, I'm glad I don't have to, again, Mishko did such a great introduction. Instead, I'm going to talk about suspense. Um, signals are synchronous, which is what uh, Misko covered quite a bit, but what happens when you need to handle the async? So let's first, I, I did get a bit of an introduction, but uh, as mentioned, I worked at, Net, at Netlify and open source. I also spent a few years before that working at eBay. Um, I was working on their uh, platform team, working on their JavaScript framework, the powers eBay.com. But I, I've been in web dev for like 25 years. Uh, I've done a lot of backend stuff, ASP.NET, uh, Rails. And I was very fortunate in the uh, early 2010s to get back into JavaScript, which is, I was working at a startup, and that's where I actually first created SolidJS and, uh, around 2016. So it's been about seven years now. Um, very different time. I'm glad to see things have been uh, changing over the last few years. All right, so suspense. Um, you might be like, what is suspense? But I, I'm, before I actually tell you what, I'm going to kind of go a little bit why. Suspense is a mechanism for orchestrating asynchronous uh, state changes in JavaScript frameworks like React or Vue or Solid, et cetera. Um, and this is a pretty complicated area, I have to admit. Um, and it's taken a lot of years of research and development for the best patterns. The reason being, uh, JavaScript frameworks are built to keep UIs in sync. That's the whole point. You interact with them, then the display updates. And they rely on guarantees around synchronous execution. Uh, async kind of throws a bit of a wrench in this. So how do we ensure our UI is consistent in these conditions? More so, what do we mean by consistent? Um, I, I always love this image. Uh, this is from uh, Michelle Westrate's introduction to MobX. He wrote, wrote this article like eight years ago. And his whole uh, premise was that uh, any system based on manual subscriptions was doomed to eventually get out of sync, like we're showing here. And this is exactly what a UI framework wants to avoid. Uh, Th think what happens when you see this, right? You kind of like lose any trust in the system underneath it. Like, is the data messed up? Is it just the UI that's out of sync? You'll, you'll definitely reload the page. That, that, that's, that's for sure. Uh, um, and it can persist sometimes in really, really annoying ways. Uh, really early React talk that I loved uh, from uh, Jing Chen. Uh, I, what was it? Uh, rethinking web de app development at Facebook. We counted the story about how Facebook Messenger had this bug that just kept coming back. They'd fix it sometimes, painstakingly so, uh, because how complicated this logic had gotten around synchronization. And this is the time when the Messenger was still inside the main Facebook app. The bug was that people would often get these phantom notifications. And uh, they'd already seen all their messages. Then they come back, and then suddenly they see this notification. You click on it, have no messages. Uh, let's say this is a little bit disheartening. Uh, what would happen is you'd either you know, stop clicking and miss messages because you're like, yeah, and there's definitely not a message there. Or you'd be very obsessively clicking and be like, I, I, do I have a new message? Uh, put it this way, this is a, this is a pretty diff sorry, uh, this was a pretty challenging place to be in. Um, it's, it's a pretty harmless bug, but every time Facebook went to go release a new feature, in the comments, someone would be complaining about this bug. Like the whole new feature launch just would get kind of thrown out the window for, with people begging to fix this bug. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is um, if you can't depend on the software you use every day, um, that, that's pretty crippling. 
Luckily, these cons uh, concern around these things uh, we, is why we have consistency guarantees and frameworks. Uh, they allow us not to focus on these details and tr you know, basically trust in what they do. Not every framework is the same, though. Uh, uh, but if you understand the rules, you kind of know where to go with this. I, I had a lot of fun. I, we were working on a new version of Marco, so we actually built the same very simple example in four different frameworks. And the idea is you, you'd have some state, like a count, then you have some drive state, like a double count, and then you put that drive state in the DOM somewhere, and then inside a click handler, you'd update that count and just console log all three values and see what would happen. Um, it seems like we can't even agree on, the, on that fact, but the, I, I could make an argument for every single one of these. It's not really um, black and white, but the important part is you understand your framework, you understand your tool, then you know, it can be considered because uh, this is its own right, and you know, I'll leave the discussion or you know, which approach is more correct uh, to the audience, so to speak. So today we're talking about async. So when I'm talking about async consistency, what am I talking about? Well, uh, tearing is the, th the thing that comes to mind. And I, okay, a perfect example of this would be, ever been to like a movies listing site and you're on like that main landing page and you're looking at the tab and you see all the posters and you go click on the next tab and there's that moment when the tab changes, the title changes, but you're still looking at the old movies. That's async tearing. And actually, I ended up finding right before this, uh, I, I started talking here, an example of this. Uh, I went to the Taste Movies app and this is the Angular, I'm not to pick on them specifically, but if you look, I'm on the popular category now and I have some movie titles. If I go pick on, let's click Adventure, look, just look at the popular on the screen for a second and see what happens. See how it updated? I, I, I know that was pretty quick. I hope it came across, but it updated before. Let's see if I can do that one more time. Let's click on, what do we got here, comedy. Th that's what I mean by tearing. And it's pretty easy to do this. You've probably all written code like this. Here, I got some React code for our, our sense, but you know, you, you've got some state. Uh, say here, I've got a uh, a list of movies, and then I've got a category which um, is new releases here. And in this example, what I'm doing is when I click a button, I set it to favorites, and that way, um, when I do my effect, uh, basically, I initially run it. And then we have no movies at the beginning. And then every time I change the category, it updates our uh, effect. And there's that moment where the category is updated, but the data hasn't loaded yet. And actually, give me two seconds. I realized I was supposed to start QuickTime screen record, and I didn't actually do that. So I might miss a bit of my talk here. So just give me two seconds. Uh, QuickTime. I apologize. I got so excited to talk about, um, about Suspense that I missed this. Uh, uh, let's see here. Quick time. You. Sorry. New screen recording. All right. Sorry about that. Let's let's, let's continue. Okay. So, this is pretty tricky. How do we solve this problem? Um, well. There's three options. We can show a placeholder, which is basically like bailout, just don't show the inconsistent state. We can stay in the past, but staying in the past can be challenging, as you saw there, right? If you're showing one thing and then you're trying to data fetch at the same time, like how do you switch the tab and essentially still show the old tab? And then finally, we can show the future. Well, that'd be nice if we could always just show the future, but we don't always have the data. This applies to a very limited subset of things you can do. Uh, for example, when you're doing data mutation, you can use the input that you put into the mutation to inform the next view. We call this optimistic UI. And what's interesting enough is all three of these patterns, we can use suspense to accomplish, and that's what I'm gonna show today. All right, so all of this conversation here to even just introduce the subject so we can talk about it. This is the hardest part with addressing async and frameworks is that it's so inherent to JavaScript that we often don't even think about handling it systematically. We just kind of like manually handle some race conditions ourselves. And in so when you're first introduced to suspense, someone probably like was like, oh, it's loading spinners. <laughs> and, and that's true, but it's, it's more than that. Suspense 
is a mechanism for creating boundaries in your view representation to ensure the async consistency for users of your application. And that, that's the definition I'm going to go with here, right? It manifests itself in many ways. Um, loading spinners is one of them, but uh, it's, it's more than that. I'm also going to talk about suspense is not, OK? Um, it is not some magic cure to data and code fetching waterfalls. It doesn't just solve waterfalls. Systems built around suspense can be informed about the async nature of dependencies in your application, but it can't make the impossible possible. The only way to prevent waterfalls is to fetch sooner, higher up in the tree, um, generally in a non-blocking fashion. Whether you're using a compiler like Relay or loader pattern like Remix or SvelteKit or Solid Start, this, this, this holds. Um, you can sometimes use like uh, key-based deduping so you don't have, like, have to pass everything through, but the only way you can prevent waterfalls is fetch non-blocking way higher up in the app, period. So with that out of the way, the other important thing, and this is, this is pretty important, all the suspense mechanism is based on reads. It's about where the data is used, not about where you do the fetching. So this is really important because you can approach suspense boundaries almost like a de designer rather than a developer. These are consistency zones based on your user interface, based on your layouts. It's not like purely mechanical. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. Because this kind of decoupling lets you kind of like look at your UI and go, where should I be loading stuff? It doesn't matter how many different async instances and fetching you're doing. It all kind of like just settle. And this makes it a lot simpler to deal with. Let's us separate these mechanisms in our UI libraries, third-party libraries, from how you approach it in your applications. That's what makes this so powerful. It's not just like a weighting in a component. It's this ability to actually approach this systematically. But you need a, a, a mechanism to read. You know, we have promises, but promises execute once. We, we need more of like a promise factory that can be cached. Luckily, in Solid, we already have something that does that. And if you can guess like my answer to almost everything, signals. <laughs> we ha they, they're able to already be multi-value, and they intercept reads. So we're, we're, already, we're already there. In our case, we have a special async signal we call resources, uh, which I kind of just threw up here very simply. It takes basically a promise, uh, returns a promise in the function, and then you're able to use that data and read it underneath the suspense boundary to trigger the nearest suspense boundary. Um, but these, these two pieces are basically the underlying uh, mechanism behind everything I'm going to show you today. So let's just get started. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go into my live coding now. And I made this really, really simple example where I've got some tabs. Tabs are always easy to show. Right now, they're not doing anything. What I did was I, I this is almost like that movies example I showed a moment ago where I have a signal that I'm setting, uh, you know, details or other, which is the lorem ipsum. And then I just have, you know, the tab that's up here. And then I have our div. And this is kind of like, a, it's using solid switch match control flow, but you can think of this as your router in your app. Um, this is just a super lightweight router. What I've also done is, well, I didn't do this. I gra React did this great experimental uh, docs about four years ago. I just grabbed the example right out of their experimental docs. They have some data around uh, the Beatles. Uh, and we'll just use this fake API um, for, for this example. So. The other page, as I said, is just a lorem ipsum. But in here, we I've started us up with our our sig our sorry resource. So I've, I'm taking our user ID, and we're calling this fake fetch user API. And the, all we need to do to get it into our app now with this data fetching API is I'm just going to go user, and then name. Okay. So now we should see John Lennon. So when I refresh this little page, you see John Lennon, and I go back, and I go back. But you see. It's white for a second. That's because the data has not loaded yet. So this is just a simple data loading mechanism. What if we want to give people an indicator that something's loaded? Well, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to wrap our router in suspense. And we're going to give the suspense a fallback. And I've already, what do we got? Class equals loader. And what, what, loading, maybe dot, dot, dot. And div. And close that and close this. 
And if everything works properly, so can we format that? Actually, I'm going to grab onto this for later. Um, you're going to see a loading state temporarily before we show John Lennon. And if I go back on the navigation, you see the same loading state. So we just decided that around our main route, we want suspense, and we're going to you know, now indicate this loading state. What's cool about this, though, is I can go in here and be like, OK, uh, actually, I'm just going to lose the copy paste right away. <laughs> Never mind. We can have another resource. I'm going to now not just load the user, I'm going to load some posts. And I'm going to fetch them in parallel because they actually both rely on the same user ID. So I fetch posts. And we're going to do a little bit more live coding here. I'm going to make a fragment. And what am I going to do? I'm going to make a list of the posts. Um, to show the list, I'm going to use solids for component. Uh, Let's import that. And for each post, we're going to post. And then we have to do li. And I think it's, what is it? Post.text, is it? Did I screw something up here? Uh, there we go, post.txt, okay, cool. So now we see John Lennon and a list of, of his posts. Uh, and when we refresh, you see them both come in. And when I go back, they both come in. Although it's taking a little longer now because I put a longer delay on the posts. The, uh, the user only comes in at 600 milliseconds and the other one takes about one and a half. Uh, seconds to load. So maybe you don't want to wait this whole amount, but that's okay. We can introduce another suspense boundary. So what I can do here is I'm just going to steal this one because I don't feel like typing as much. And we can just nest a suspense boundary because it's only the nearest read that matters here. So in our case, and we're going to say what? Loading posts. In our case, the first resource is being read here at the top, which then will get captured by the parent suspense boundary. And then this lower suspense boundary uh, will catch when we read the posts. So now they're in two separate suspense boundaries. And when we load, what you're going to see is loading and then loading posts. And when we go back, it's the same. However, what I want to point out here, which is really cool, is we can also like mess with the timeout. Look, if I make this 200 milliseconds, we don't have to show the in intermediate state. Like if the posts happen to load before the main user, well then it's, they're just going to all show together, right? And same when we navigate back and forth. So we have a certain amount of flexibility here uh, to not like worry about this problem of these race conditions. Suspense and resources will handle that for you automatically. Uh, and it's more than just data fetching, right? It's really easy to show with data fetching, but it really can be any promise. I mean, I could say technically it doesn't even need to be a promise, but promises have some nice properties, mostly that they expect to resolve, like they're going to resolve or reject, and that they actually execute once. A moment ago I said that was maybe not the best thing, but in this case it's good. We have like a contract. We're like, if people are building APIs around promises, they expect them to resolve. Um, and so I said anything can resolve. Um, it could be assets like images, it could be async, device APIs, it could even be lazy components, right? Like, I could go in here and be like, instead of uh, loading this here, I could be like, let's go const details equals lazy. Again, I'm going to import that. But lazy, with import details. And if I did stuff somewhat properly, like, we're, we're lazy loading the component now. And it's still falling into those same placeholders. Like we, we designed our app around the suspense boundaries, and it doesn't matter how many of these asyncs come in, everything just gets consolidated around our design. Okay. And what about handling errors? Well, sometimes promises reject. Luckily, we already have a means to do this. Error boundaries. Um, resources interact with them in a very natural way. Remember, um, it isn't about where the fetch is but where the read is. So again, you know, I can go into our details. Actually, let's, let's, let's fake an error here. Let's just at the beginning of where we fetch posts, just go reject, or I think, just return reject 
um, new error. I don't know. <laughs> you have failed. Okay. <laughs> um, and initially, yeah, this is not good. We're getting error in the console. But if we design our UI with this in sync, let's wrap our suspense boundary here with an error boundary, error boundary with a fallback of, I don't know, what should we do? Should we, let's actually H2, let's yell at the person. Um, and sorry, our error boundary is also take an argument here, so I can go like error to string. And then actually close it. And then maybe format it with prettier, I don't know. It's a, well, you, you get my point though, right? Um, you, you can handle it, see, we fetched at the top, but it was where the actual value got used that affects where the errors actually occur in your app. Again, this is like a layout consideration. So it also happens when we navigate back. And this gives us a lot of tools without ever going like, is loading, is error, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can literally just do this all via layouts. Okay. And there's, there's no rule that suspense only needs to run in the browser. Um, this awareness of async can not only tell us when we're done server rendering, but which parts of the page actually are ready. Well, suspense we can be credited to React. Um, a very similar concept called async fragments was introduced in the Marco framework uh, back in 2013, and it's, that's what's been powering eBay.com. Uh, its purpose was to allow out-of-order streaming. So you can imagine when I joined the team at eBay three years ago, I like immediately ported that over to Solid. Um, I'll show you, show you a bit of what I mean, right? Because in the same way we can load our data on the client and like no one pieces are done until loading states, you can do the exact same thing from the server. Um, as it turns out, you can actually leave the HTML response open and just keep on tagging stuff to the bottom of the document, including script tags, which can move the HTML into place or can start hydration or serializing data. So you get an experience on the right here that looks kind of like your client loading situation, but this is actually server rendering. All the requests happen sooner. You don't have to wait for the JavaScript to load on your page. And you know, typical SSR is kind of like this. It's like wait for the whole page to load, sh show it. And you can see even with the image, there's benefits of to out order of streaming because it just gets there that much sooner, even if the main content of the page actually arrives at the same time. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Of course, I have another demo for this. Uh, because the, the key part isn't just the UX experience. I want to show you that we can use almost the exact same code. Because I'm going to go in here and look. Now, this is a solid start app. But we have a very similar setup in our main app. Yeah, there's HTML in the head and whatnot. But now, we, we still have um, our main section where I'm going to have suspense route, uh, wrapping our router. I put a header and footer in here just to like prove that I'm not making this stuff up. And if I go over to inside our route, our index route, and shrink that down, what you're gonna see is a component that looks very much like what we've been using this whole time. It's gonna have those two resources, and then we have suspense wrapping our list of posts, right? And when I reload this page, it's that same waterfall, except this time that data fetching all happens on the server. And, you know, of course, I gotta prove it, right? So. I'm going to go to the network tab here, uh, presumably, and look at our document. Yeah, cool. And hopefully, let's see if I can blow this up. Eh, maybe that's too much. Well, actually, that's probably too much. What you're going to see here is, yeah, there's some inline CSS, some HTML. But when we get down to the body, we're going to see inside the body, we're going to see our header that I showed. And if you're wondering what those data HKs are, they're a thing that we use for hydration to link up our templates because we don't have a virtual DOM and everything can be created out of order with JSX. It's pretty crazy. But in any case, header there. Then we see loading. And then we see the footer. And then you know some small hydration setup scripts. But what I want to point out is the HTML body tag actually closes here. And after the fact, we get another template, which has John Lennon and yet another loading state. And then is some code to hydrate John Lennon, and then this code is actually what puts it into place. And if I go down further, we have another template now with all our data, and then uh, the data actually hydrate um, that. So you can see we just keep on just adding it to the bottom of the list, um, and it, it kind of actually just loads in it uh, with a lot of loading affordances. But the thing is, maybe you don't want to wait, um, or sorry, maybe you do want to wait, um, 
for some of the data to load. You don't want to like have all those loading states. Maybe you have auth you have to worry about. So what you can do is just go to your resource and go defer stream true. And if I do this, um, now we're going to wait for John Lennon to load before we stream the page. What you can see here is now we only get that one loading state. Um, and I mean, I can also go here and defer stream this true, and now we won't see any loading states. So this is this is completely in our control. I'm actually clicking refresh. You're just not seeing anything. The reason the loading was popping in was HMR, you know, fun stuff. But essentially, you have using the exact same resources, exact same suspense pattern. You have full control of how your data comes into your app, even during SSR, right? No, you don't need server components or anything. This is just data fetching suspense, right? And that pretty much is the end of my placeholder part. But as I mentioned, sometimes we want to stay in the past. The reason is sometimes it's kind of like really jarring to be like on a page and then suddenly like remove all the content to put in like our loading indicator. So if we've already got content, uh, it's been studied, that has shown that it's quite often useful to keep most of the content on the page, it will feel like it's actually smoother or faster just by kind of almost tricking the user. And that's where we have to introduce a new concept, transitions. Um, this is trickier because we can't just block on async and think everything's going to be OK. The reason we can't is because you have some independent state change that has to like read from that other state. And if it sees it in the inconsistent state, well, perfect example. Uh, let's go back to our moving tabs. You click to the next user in like a carousel, and then you know you've clicked it, but it hasn't updated yet, and then you click the follow button afterwards. Who are you following? <laughs> the user that you were looking at or the user you're loading? This is, this is why it's not enough to uh, just block on async, like, like an async component, when you have interactivity. You need to have some kind of guarantees. So the way we, it's called transition. I actually, I went with that name because that's what React called them. I kind of feel they're more like database transactions, if that helps people for a mental model. Like you have the ability to isolate a change and all its async uh, dependencies and then apply it again at the, at the end, um, basically when everything's finished. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you what I mean by this. Um, let's go to my next little demo here. So I've removed the nested suspense for a moment because it's distracting this, but what you can see, this is what I'm talking about. When you switch, you see this loading indicator, right? So, and that could be jarring if you could be showing other content. So what we can do here is we can use a primitive called use transition. And if I go in here and go const, uh, what is it? Uh, is pending and start equals use transition. I'm going to wrap our tab change in this transition. And the reason we do this is any async behavior that derives further from this change of tabs now is going to be marked as like part of a separate transaction. We're not going to show it until everything async for it loads. So when I go initially on the page, yes, we get this loading indicator because we have no content to show. But when I go back to it, it's going to hold for a second. And I mean really hold. It looks actually like the app's frozen because not even the tab changed. Right? Like it actually sticks there. Let's show it one more time. I'm going to click. Now the tab changes. Uh, obviously, this isn't the best UI experience, but it shows that I did manage to load while staying in the past. So what we can do is I'm going to very quickly add a pending class to this. I'm going to go is pending. And now with this pending class, you can actually give maybe a visual indicator. So I've kind of slightly graded it out um, on a delay. So if it loads fast, you don't see the gray out. But otherwise, there's just a slight indicator, and then it moves across. So you can, you can see that you can still apply you know, loading uh, indicators without unloading the page back to this fallback. And how do this works? It's probably too technical to get into in a couple minutes. But I think for people's mindsets, most of you use Git. It's kind of like a rebase where updates to the main branch, updates both sides, and then you, when it's done, you kind of put the async stuff over top when it commits. That's, that's going to be my simple solution, uh, explanation. It is trickier than this, but um, I, I'm hoping that that at least makes a little bit of sense. But the other important thing about transitions you have to understand is that it's global. If you remember, our tabs were not under the suspense boundary, yet somehow, it held. It didn't move the tab across. Otherwise, you'd have tearing. So the, it has to be global. 
What Suspense does in this case is tell us that any part of the UI actually depends on that resource change, that it's part of the tree. But the actual application of transitions spans the whole app. So sometimes you actually want to opt out of this because it's like, you're like, I, I, I don't need to wait for all that data. It's that same problem again. And guess what? It has the exact same solution once more. All we need to do is get our nested uh, suspense boundary back. And if we put our nested suspense boundary back, see, there's this funny thing that React did. Um, and what is it, loading posts? And I, I think it's very clever. Is, and we did the same in Solid, is that any new suspense boundary will always go to fallback. Any existing suspense boundary will hold under transition. So this gives you, again, as a designer, control over how the flow works without worrying about where that transition's happening. So in our case, initial load, we have our loading states. When I go back, it's now only gonna wait for John Lennon, and then we have the, the more detailed view. So you, you get, just by moving the suspense boundary around, you get complete control. In fact, I can add one last suspense boundary, even though there's a transition baked into our router, we can pretend. Uh, and if I do this and go loading, what was it, loading user, we can basically get our initial um, experience, even though there's a transition going on. So even, what the, what's really cool about this is, is third-party component libraries, routers, can build transitions in by default. You control transitions just by where you put your suspense boundaries. So it's like a, it's a layout UI kind of concerns. I think that's a very beautiful design, obviously. <laughs> but, and that, that, that's really actually most for showing the past. How are we doing on time? Okay, so uh, I got w one more uh, thing, which is showing the future and optimistic updates. And um, I think I'm just gonna go straight into, into, into uh, kind of sh explaining something kind of fundamental here. And it's kind of fundamental to the web. I think mutation APIs have confused people a little bit because there's been this kind of, cons like people see resources and data fetching, especially in Solid, and they try and use it for the same thing. But in the web, there's always been like a git and a post. And this modeling pattern is what we see now, whether it happens in the client or on the server with server components and actions, um, and the idea is that you have like the read side, which happens when you initially load or navigate. You resolve a route, you fetch some data, show some loading indicators, um, and you finish rendering, right, after you hide the loading indicators. All a mutation does is start the mutation, shows maybe some optimistic update, and then goes into that like page re-render cycle, and then the only difference at the end is it also hides the optimistic updates. So there's overlap on these concepts, but they're, they're, they are actually almost like two kind of pathways th through your application. You, you don't want to duplicate that code. You're, you already have written how things render. So mutations is just additive. It's not like a separate path. So um, let me see here if I can get to my last th demo, demo here. Okay, so now, I see this isn't my last demo. I gotta hurry up. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got something where I'm just like adding posts, I have a, an input. And what I wanted to show here is that I've also added a fake API which random has a random timeout on that in input. So I'm just gonna go in here and I've added a, a new signal which ties to that input and um, all, to do a mutation in a simplistic way is would be just to get our new API endpoint, which I think I called add post, get the current value of the new post signal, and um, then refetch our data, okay? And what's refetch? Well, you notice that I keep on, these resources had arrays. Well, there was a reason for that. There is actually a right side of create resource. So you, you can just put refetch in here. And now, our data mutation is pretty simple. We just add it, clear the input, and then refetch the data. So I'm gonna say, what? let's put imagine, okay, and we can click add. Oh, wait a second, you see that? It went back to a loading state. That's because our app has uh, suspense in it. So what we actually wanna do here is wrap the refetch in a transition. 
And as it turns out, I showed use transition before because it gives you the pending state, but you can also use start transition directly. And if we wrap our refetch in uh, start transition here, and now I try, imagine, you can just add it, and then it shows up, right? So again, we, we can use the same kind of loading indicators. But th there is a gap there when it was there. Like, we entered it, and then it didn't show up in the list right away because I had to go to the server. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, optimistic updates. How hard are they with a system like this? Well, I have an RFC up for solid, but let's I, I had one more example on the mutation that I thought would kind of hammer this in really easily. I just made a mutation API on the fly, and it's really just a signal that holds a list of in-flight requests and a map that maps them to their promises. So basically, whenever you mutate something, you run the function provided, get the promise, and say, here, associate this promise with those variables, and set that signal. And then when it's done, remove it, set it. There's two pieces of data. The reason I did it is just it's more ergonomic to have an array in the signal, but I needed a map for lookup. Um, I could have probably done this in a, in a simpler way. But the reason I wanted to show this is because then this create mutation that I just made basically does the same thing where it goes our add post and start transition around our refetch. We can basically just intercept that add so we can add it to our mutation API. And then all I need to do is take the list of in-flight posts, what do I call this, pending posts, and in this case, it's not a whole post object. It's just the title that we pass to each mutation. So if I put the title in here, well, um, and actually, let's give a class in here. I'm just going to use that same loading class we had before. Class, sorry, equals loader. If now when I do this and I click add, we have that optimistic API UI. It took basically 15 lines of code. You can add progressive enhancement and whatever on top. But once you have these primitives, doing the stuff that you see in Remix or Spellkit or whatever, it's very, 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 very simple. Um, and because of the transitions, I'll try and do this really quickly if I can. But I can, I can basically handle <laughs> the race conditions. Um, yeah, this is why you should have coded it as a form and put enter in it. I can, I can handle the race conditions. You're not really seeing it great. I'll see if I can get multiple at the same time, but yeah, whatever. My point is you can jam as much as you need into this. And again, transitions are handling those race conditions for you, just built in. All right, all right. So one last topic, because you can't talk about suspense without someone going, what about that really cool thing with the radar that Danny Bromoff showed a few years ago? Um, no one's talking about this anymore. I honestly wasn't sure we needed it or wanted it in solid, because it's got to do with CPU execution. You can't, it, and because of consistency reasons, we have to still always apply our effects at the same time. It's, it's time slicing does not impact rendering. If something's expensive to render, it will always be expensive to render. It's If you have a system with a lot of distributed um, expensive stuff. But the way we do this is, OK, what if not only trans uh, promises indicate that you know, something should be async? What if you could just say this piece of work was lower priority and then have it work in its own kind of place? And we can do this in solid because, as it turns out, our reactive primitives actually map up exactly to React's life cycles. Um, like you have state, then you have that like pure rendering part, then you have like with the actual DOM updates, and then you have the end user effects. So, in my last really quick demo, and th again this is this is under an, ex an experimental flag. It was added solid a couple years ago. I have to admit I've not come across any real world example for this. I just wanted to show that it could be done without a virtual DOM. Um, I've got concurrent rendering. So I don't have a cool radar, but I have this color swatch you can see at the top. And when I start my, our demo here, and we switch to 500 items, you can see that it, th this can easily handle that rendering, because this is not too hard to spin a bunch of circles. However, in order to you know, emphasize how expensive things are, I'm going to make a computed value or a memo, uh, is it called in solid, where I put this fake delay on every single count update. So it affects both creation and, um, uh, sorry, yeah, both creation and update. Now, this time when I switch to 500, you better believe it's going to have some problems. Every time the number changes, we're kind of getting shaky. So 
I, again, if, if we enable this scheduling, which is this kind of experimental feature, and we wrap the key points, which are, let me see here, uh, when we update our count here, so let me do, what is it? Start transition and do that. And also where we do create the boxes, start transition. I need to reload the page because I can see the console going crazy with my typos. Let's go. Okay, cool. Now, that same cost, switching to 500, doesn't cause it to go red, and stuff keeps on updating. But I want you to notice the impact of this. Check it out. I'm going to switch this, and what you're going to see is it does, has to do all this work in the background and then wait for everything to update before it can apply all the changes at once. So there's actually a delay between me hitting this 500 and the circle showing up. But it smoothed out the animation. The animation never stopped. The bar never went red. So this is basically the use case. If you already have something expensive distributed across your system, if you have singularly expensive stuff, this is not going to help. If you have some crazy 3D rendering that's super expensive, this is not going to help. But if your system is full of heavy computation that's distributed, maybe like a really, really large app that maybe has like a virtual DOM or something, then this could help. But it's interesting. I'm looking for real life use cases. Um, so I just wanted to show, though, what this technology can do. Anyway, all in all, suspense and transitions provide very useful tools for handling the problem of making our user interfaces consistent. That's a big benefit to end users. It isn't about performance. It isn't just about data fetching. It's about making it easier to create UIs that users can trust and that behave in expected ways and offer a smooth experience no matter how they navigate your web application. Like what you heard today, you can find all the resources you need off solidjs.com and uh, find me on Twitter. And I love streaming on Fridays for several, several hours about JavaScript frameworks if you want to come and nerd out with me. Thank you.